Welcome to rigorous training in longitudinal data science, Radiance. Welcome to this Radiance presentation on causal questions. This session covers what are causal questions, answering causal questions is difficult, identification, and sources of bias. Causal questions are fundamental to all walks of life. These are questions that try to uniquely ascertain the effects that an action, policy, or innovation has on something else. Causal questions are particularly common in medical and biological sciences. For example, whether a new vaccine protects against infection from a virus, or whether obesity causes cancer. However, they are equally important in other areas such as education, social science, criminology, and development of poorer nations. Examples from these fields include whether educational attainment leads to higher salaries, whether retirement affects mental health, the effect of policing on crime, and whether microcredits help people out of poverty. When answering causal questions, the cause is normally a policy, an innovation, or some form of intervention. It is common practice to refer to the cause as a treatment. The object or characteristic that the policy, innovation or intervention intends to affect is referred to as the outcome. For example, when asking, does a new vaccine protect against infection from a virus? The treatment is the new vaccine, while the outcome is infection. In a similar fashion, when asking whether policing reduces crime, the treatment is policing and the outcome is crime. While asking causal questions is easy, answering them is very difficult. This is because to really understand if a treatment has an effect on an outcome, you need to observe simultaneously how the outcome would evolve with and without the treatment. To understand this concept, meet Ray. Ray is a keen runner, but has recently injured a knee. Suppose you want to know if physiotherapy is effective in helping Ray with his injury. Ray could undergo physiotherapy, or he could skip physiotherapy altogether. To clearly ascertain if physiotherapy helps Ray, one needs to see the evolution of Ray's injury simultaneously under both states of the world, that is, with physiotherapy and without it. That is, the effect of physiotherapy on Ray's knee is a comparison at the same point in time of Ray's recovery without physiotherapy and Ray's recovery with physiotherapy. The problem, of course, is that at any given point in time, we can only observe one of both situations. Either Ray's knee has undergone physio, or it has not. The state of the world we cannot observe is said to be a counterfactual. It's important to emphasise that the comparison is at the same point in time. It would make no sense otherwise. If Ray receives physiotherapy and then he rests, and eventually his knee heals, we won't be able to ascertain with certainty if the knee healed because of the rest or the physio, or in what proportion each factor contributed to the healing process. The existence of one unobserved or counterfactual state of the world is the first reason why answering causal questions is difficult we say that there is a fundamental problem of identification. This is also known as the fundamental problem of causal inference. You might wonder if, when answering causal questions, we can't just get lots of data, some from treated people, and some from people who were not treated, and then compare the outcomes in both groups. 
in practice, we will end up doing just that. However, this will present a second problem known as bias. To understand bias, let's introduce you to Bernie, Ray's friend, who is also a keen runner, but who has no injuries at present. Ray's knee is injured, but suppose, although we don't know this, that physiotherapy is beneficial for him. Suppose, for example, that without physiotherapy, Ray would recover only partially, so that his overall health would stay at, say, 70% of his best possible health. Suppose, conversely, that with physio, Ray's knee recovers quickly, and this results in Ray's health being restored to, say, 90%. Now, Bernie's knee is not injured. Being a keen runner, Bernie's current level of health is good, let's say 95% of his best possible health. But suppose that physiotherapy would also benefit Bernie, and in fact, physiotherapy would restore Bernie's health to his maximum 100%. In this example, then, physiotherapy is good. It improves Bernie's health by 5 points, but it massively improves Ray's health by 20 points. What happens, however, is that in real life, Ray and Bernie will each decide on what to do, to book an appointment with a physiotherapist or not. Physiotherapy is expensive, so while Ray has a great incentive to undergo treatment, Bernie does not. After all, in this tale, treatment will benefit Ray a lot, but it will only minimally benefit Bernie. So, in real life, most likely Ray will undergo treatment, and we will observe Ray's health having undergone physiotherapy. And most likely Bernie will save his money, and will not undergo treatment. So we will observe Bernie's health without physiotherapy. What data will we have in real life? We will see Ray's health with physiotherapy, which stands at 90%. We will see Bernie's health without physiotherapy, standing at 95%. When we compare Ray and Bernie's data, what does this tell us? Since Ray's health stands lower than Bernie's health, and only Ray has undergone physio, we would conclude that physiotherapy is bad for you, which in this tale we know is wrong. What is happening in the Ray-Bernie story is that although physiotherapy is good for everybody, Ray's health starts at a great disadvantage. Physiotherapy fixes him, but his health levels do not recover to 100%. Although physio is good for Ray, he cannot catch up. In essence, comparing the health of an injured person after physio with the health of a person who was not injured is wrong. The right comparison would have been that of Ray's health after physiotherapy with the health level of another person with similar ailments but without physiotherapy. When the treated and non-treated groups in a sample are not comparable in this way, our data and analyses will be subject to and affected by bias. If we can conclude that the units in a causal study had been comparable on the outcome prior to treatment being available and delivered, then the bias might not be a problem. In practice, there will be a number of limited situations where this might occur. Clinical and lab experiments are a good example of this. In this setting, experimental methods result in datasets where the treated and control groups are comparable before the treatment is available and delivered. However, causal questions are relevant in other areas where experiments are either unethical, too expensive, or unfeasible. Think, for example, of studies trying to answer causal questions about policing, education, or retirement decisions. In these other settings, we need to rely on survey or other observational data, that is, non-experimental data, to undertake causal studies, and then we will be systematically subject to the Ray-Bernie problem. Nonetheless, even in these more challenging settings, 
techniques exist that can sometimes help us to answer causal questions. The real name of the Ray Burney problem is confounding bias or selection bias. In the natural sciences, confounding bias is the more frequent denomination. In other areas, such as economics, selection bias is more common. The difference between the two terms arises primarily because this form of bias has various sources, and each discipline tends to emphasise different sources of bias. In summary, we have seen that causal questions are asked in the hope of clearly identifying if a treatment, such as a new policy or a medical innovation, or any sort of intervention or manipulation, influences an outcome. Whereas causal questions are easy to ask, they are very difficult to answer. This is due to, first, a problem of identification. At any point in time, we cannot observe a person, a firm, a country, or so on, under both the treatment of interest and in its absence. Second, there is a problem of confounding or selection bias. When data are available, treated individuals and non-treated individuals need to be comparable before treatment is available and delivered for us to be able to answer causal questions. Finally, here are some resources to learn more about this topic. Thank you for watching. For more information, visit our website www.radiance.org.uk. Thank you.